Here's the title for today, Don't Forget Joy, which is funny because um, our joy is actually sitting on the, on the front row, Breckland Joy. Um, joy is her middle name because she's been a little stuffy. We didn't want to put her back there with your kids, and, um, and you blame us for getting them sick. But she's on the front row, and so Joy might actually talk back to me during this. Just, just let me parent and do my thing, amen? And so Joy is to experience great pleasure or delight. That's just a simple definition definition of what it is. How many know kids are really awesome when you're in the middle of a chaotic time, a hard and difficult time, and your little kids are not aware of that? They don't, they don't really care. They, they can do things that can make you forget for a moment. They can do things to make you smile when it's been extremely difficult to smile. And this kid is, uh, she's really good at it. So it's, I'm glad I got a great example sitting on the front row. Um, she talks like she's 22 and, um, and she has more sass than the, her siblings do combined together. And so we've kind of enjoyed her this week and just some of her funny moments. I'm not going to dive into it, but it's been a heavy week and it's been a heavy week for a lot of people. It's been heavy months and maybe even years for some people. We just know that life can bring sorrow, difficulties, pain, and grief. Uh, If you watch the news too much, it'll prompt fear and even give you an unnecessary anxiety. Sometimes we have rough days. Sometimes we have rough weeks. Sometimes we have rough months or even a year. How many of you want to say amen to that? Uh, This past week, it's been rough. Uh, But I heard the Lord on Thursday say, don't forget joy. Don't forget joy. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, she said this, never let anything so fill you with sorrow that it makes you forget the joy of Christ risen. That spoke to me when I read that. And it reminded me, I believe Jesus had joy on the cross. I want you to think about that. Being nailed to a cross, being ridiculed, being made fun of, in great pain, I think he had joy on the cross. Here's why. Because Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before The joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't think he enjoyed nails in his hands, but I think he understood the big picture. I think he knew that that had just a small, just a small window of time to impact him, that there was an expiration date on that cross, and he would move from there and be seated back at the right hand of the Father. And because of that, I think he carried joy. In fact, I even want to have you open your Bibles to Philippians 1. Because in spite of our circumstances and our situation, we can still have joy. Paul's letter to the Philippians, you see him carry joy. And if you didn't understand the backstory, if you didn't take time to research it, you wouldn't know that he was actually in a terrible situation when he wrote this letter. The Apostle Paul's letter, this is to the church of Philippi. This is the first church that was planted in Europe. It was planted about A.D. 52. And Paul is writing to encourage the Christians at Philippi to live joyfully in every circumstance. It's a short letter, but in it, Paul mentions joy 16 times. The Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter from prison. He was in prison when he wrote this. And he wrote it somewhere between AD 60 and 62. And he writes to encourage an already established church to mature, continue to mature. The Roman prison that he was in was believed to be underground. And listen to this, the way that they would guard a prisoner like one of his status, what they would do is they would chain him to a guard. So he's in a prison, underground, limited light, not treated that well, and he's chained 
to a guard. So he's always got someone around him, which just preaches Romans where it talks about what, what, what's meant for evil. God will use it for the good because you'll see in this letter like the gospel is moving forward to the people who are actually imprisoning him. He's literally sharing the gospel. So it was almost like what the world meant for evil, God meant for good. It was changing, I bet you, the guards' lives. The many guards that were probably rotating on shift, being changed, chained to the God. Man, here we are, that gospel guy. You got to pull a 12 hour shift. What are you going to do? I'm just going to sit there with him, chained to him, so he doesn't run off, but he doesn't even want to run off. He just keeps telling me about Yeshua. And so he's sitting underground writing this letter in prison, not the most ideal circumstances or situations. He has a death sentence. He's waiting to die. He has a death sentence when he writes this letter. I just want you to understand that uh, before we dive into it. So verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the posture of Paul here in some very dark days. He's writing a letter. And he's prophesying grace and peace over the church. Notice what he does in verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. First off, as a pastor, I started thinking about the church here. I was like, man, the church of Philippi had to be a pretty incredible church. Because here he is as an apostle who set up a church. And by this time, Paul had been through a lot of church hurt. He'd been through a lot of disagreements. He had done a lot of teaching on this stuff. And and here he is still thanking God for them. I'm willing to bet he had some issues with them too, not just other churches. But yet he's still thanking God for them. And as a pastor, I'm just reading this and I'm like, hmm, convicting, convicting. Because I'll, I'll just be honest, sometimes in ministry, One of the hardest things to thank God for is people. I didn't mean that as a shot. I'm just being real with you. Right? Some of you are probably sitting out there, well, sometimes praying for the church, some of the hardest to give thanks for is the pastor. I understand. People. Amen? But notice all these pressing external circumstances, yet he's still giving thanks. In all my prayers for all of you, this is what he says in verse 4, I always pray with joy. Convicting. It wasn't some grueling, taxing thing. He actually enjoyed it. Why? Because he had an understanding of what prayer was. And I've said it a bunch this year. Prayer equals relationship. It wasn't actually probably about what he was saying. It's about who he was interacting with and saying to. Because prayer, he prays with joy because he's, prayer equals relationship. He's communing with God. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. May that verse encourage each and every single one of us. We're not a finished product yet. God is going to continue to do what he's doing, and he will finish it in Jesus' name. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So it's obvious that God has burdened his heart for a people. It's just incredible to see him talking like this in a situation. Verse 9, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight, revelation, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless 
for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. What a prayer. May we receive that. May we align with that as well. Paul, while he's praying, this is fatherly. This is joyful. This is mature. This is powerful. He's excited to pray for people that he loves. He's not just walking through the motions. He's not just making it happen. Like he's invested and he's, he's really about it. Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I want you to think about that real quick. What if you start looking at the things that are happening to you as an opportunity to advance the gospel? Verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard, meaning all those people who were watching him, to everyone else, other prisoners, that I am in chains for Christ. What does that mean? I haven't done anything illegal. They know the truth, and the truth is impacting them. Look at this, verse 14. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Don't forget joy. We're going to talk about some James here in a minute. But don't forget joy. What if what you're going through, what if it's actually to mature you and to advance the kingdom of God in and through your life? This has been a great reminder for me this weekend. Listen, how many of you can say this? If I was in prison, I'd be joyful like Paul. Paul is in prison and carrying joy, amen? Listen, happiness and joy are definitely two different things. I want to make sure we understand that, by the way. Like people say this all the time, God just wants you happy. No, he doesn't. He wants you full of joy. He wants you filled with joy, and joy trumps happiness. You think happiness is awesome? It is to a small degree. But we need to understand what it is, and we need to understand what joy actually is. Happiness is external. It's based on your circumstances and situations, right? It happens by chance. Happiness is fleeting. And if I could just use this word, happiness is also shady. You can't trust it because it's here one minute and gone the next. This is why we like use, have you ever heard the term? I've used it. I need some retail therapy, right? I'm going through something. I need something to distract me. I need something to make me happy for a minute. For me, that's shoes. So I, I, I'll say something to Tiff when I get stressed. Like, I think I need to buy a pair of shoes, which really means you need to go pray, Jason, right? Because one thing I've learned about getting a pair of shoes, that instant purchase, right, that impulsive purchase, it, it feels good for a moment, then you put the shoes on. You're like, man, these things ain't even comfortable at all, right? Or if you're like me, you got four kids and you walk outside and your kid steps on them immediately. But it, it never solves the problem. Joy can because it's lasting. Joy is actually birthed internally and it's by the Holy Spirit. And honestly, it's waiting for us to choose it, to choose joy. And joy is faithful and can be trusted because it's part of the DNA of God. It is. And so I've got a number of points for you, like four, I believe. I didn't number them this time, so I think it's four, and I don't want to scroll down to the bottom and get ahead of myself. But here's the first one. The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is the source of joy. Holy Spirit is the source of joy of joy. If you want joy, something that's not fleeting, something that's not shady, something that's lasting, something that's internal, doesn't matter what's happening to you externally, but you can still carry that. Holy Spirit is the source of that. We need to understand it. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. We know the fruits of the Spirit are here. It talks about the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. 
in our lives. It's divine love, and it manifests in eight different ways. And one of them is joy. Joy. It comes from Him. It comes from being in a loving relationship with Him. One translation refers to it as joy overflowing. I want you to think about that. It's something internal that is so incredible that in that divine relationship with God, being in love with Him and being close with Him, that the joy that's in you will actually ooze out of you. That it will come out of you. Some of you, it's like a volcanic eruption. Now, any Puss in Boots fans here? Puss in Boots? Anybody? So I had this idea, the most recent one. I don't remember what it's called. But I took my kids there, and I didn't understand the dark side of that movie. And it was like one of the ones where Liam looked at me, and he was like, hey, we got to leave, Dad. And I was like, yeah, we got to get up out of there. And it scared them. But I saw it was on Amazon, so it wasn't long ago. I, I said, man, I'm going to watch the whole thing. Basically, they were trying to get somewhere, and they had this map, and whoever handled the map determined what the path was like. Because what it did is it revealed their soul. And so it was Puss in Boots and his girlfriend that he left hanging at the altar in the, in the show before. Um, I can't remember her name. But anyway, anytime he handled it, it looked, it looked dark. Anytime she handled it, it had like these, these flowers and different things that would try to eat them. Anybody seen this, right? They had this dog that was with them. That just reminds me of so many people that are unaware. Puss in Boots met this dog in a cat rescue. And this dog was dressed up like a cat living in this cat rescue. And he talks, and he's just, he's just so happy, so encouraging, so loving, right? This dog's like awesome. I can't remember this dog's name. Anyway, this Grim Reaper's coming to get Puss in Boots and comes to the cat place, and Puss in Boots runs off, and the dog goes with him, and Puss in Boots is trying to leave the dog, and the dog just pops up everywhere, and he keeps calling him like his best friend, and he tells Puss in Boots his story. He's like, man, one time... They, they threw me in the water, and I had this thing tied to me, and they left me, and I got untied, and I went looking for them. I couldn't find them. He was like, I don't know what happened. And he was like, I'm trying to find. And it's like, bro, they were trying to kill you. Did you not know that? Like, I'm watching this, and I'm getting into it, right? He's in aggravation to Puss in Boots, but when he grabs, when he grabs the map and he holds it, they notice that the route to get to the place they're trying to get to, it became incredible. And easy to get to because it was a reflection of his heart. He was so pure. He just overflowed with joy. He wasn't critical. He wasn't mean. He was just such an encourager. And Puss in Boots picked up like, hey, you need to keep the map because if you have the map, it's way easier for us to get to where we need to go. And I was like watching this and I was like, dear Lord, this thing is preaching right here. You know what I'm saying? And this is what I think about with that divine love relationship with God, that eventually what's inside of us is going to come out. And joy that overflows is what the people of God should be marked with. I know we're going to go through things. I know circumstances, situations, difficulties are going to happen. But we need to remember there's a joy that overflows when you're in close relationship with the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, listen to this, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So he's the source, right? Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, the disciples at Antioch, it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. One translation says, that they were overflowing with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 
So, do we see He is the source? No matter what comes our way, Holy Spirit is with us. Therefore, joy is also with us, waiting for us to recognize and embrace it. We need only to realize this truth and tap into the truth. That joy is with us no matter what we go through. No matter what we go through. Nothing this world brings our way can separate us from the love of God, the promises of God, and the truth of God. And because of that, we can access joy no matter what. It's the truth. What did Nehemiah say in Nehemiah 8? I believe it's verse 10. He says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When we feel weak, you know what that means? We need the joy of the Lord. We need the joy of the Lord. Here's my next point. Difficult times will push us towards joy. James 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, meaning the best kind of joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds... Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. One translation says it this way. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. I have learned that difficult times, no matter what the cause of those difficulties are, provide a great opportunity for me to grow closer to God. That when others cannot bring comfort or clarity, I can find both in his presence and in his word. Paul, living in difficulties, was writing to the Philippian church. He reminds us that joy is available because God is available, even in the toughest of times. He had every reason to feel hopeless and down, but he chose to fix his eyes on Jesus. And when he did, not only did he find joy in the harshest of seasons, he also delivered hope to those closest to him, to the church, and even to us today with these writings. I want you to see that. The reality is when we go towards joy, we go towards God. Because He is the only source of joy. Amen? And so, joy is found in His presence. It's exactly what Psalm 16, verse 11 says. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore presence if you've been here for any amount of time you you know you see the, the logos with the anchors there's three anchors this is one of the first questions i always get from people hey why three anchors like what is the purpose of that and when we started the church, we just said, man, we just believed that there was three things that would be a catalyst to a transformed life. And those three things are being anchored in the presence of God. Anchor brings security. Stability means I'm unwavering. Even though the storm comes and the boat bounces around, I stay location. I stay with God. First one being anchored in his presence. Next was anchored in his family. The third, his mission, which is why we did Bold Week. We believe when you are in the presence of God and you're with the people of God and serving the purpose of God, you will mature and you will grow and your life will be different. That's what we believe. For the past two years, we've really been focusing on this first anchor. Because the third anchor, is a, it's, it's super important. But that third one, of the purpose of God and the mission of God, if it becomes your first one, then you get things out of order. And you run the risk of doing a bunch of stuff for God and not being in relationship with Him. And so being anchored in the presence of God, like, and I'm not just talking about Sunday church attendance. Like, I'm talking about this is how I live my life. Like, we need to live our life. This is why we birthed the prayer room. 
It's because we need to learn to come and sit and dwell and be in the presence of God. One of the greatest feedbacks that I get from people is like, man, that's really uncomfortable. Worshiping longer is uncomfortable. And, it, and for me, it, it just it shows a need to mature us to a place to not be in a hurry and learn to sit and dwell with God. When we get in a hurry, I'm guilty of this. We get impulsive. And we start trying to be God. And we get ahead of God. And like I always say, ahead of God is out of the will of God. We want to learn to be in his presence. And listen, the beautiful thing is no matter what the world brings our way, we can still be in his presence. Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. This is why we need it. Like, you can't church enough for life not to happen with you. You do realize that, right? Like when they went into the upper room, they walked out with a bunch of problems. I just want you to know that. They also walked out with a power. But they walked straight into a bunch of problems. These were people who abandoned Christ, who was with him, right? They go into the upper room and they had this killer church service. But then the Lord was sending them out of the room. And then life came. And guess what it cost them? Their lives. Like not just followers on social media, not just an inconvenience of this or that. It literally cost them everything. Life came at them, yet they still carried joy. You want to know why? Because they had the Holy Spirit. They had the tangible presence of God. Amen? This is why we need to be anchored in His presence. Because no matter what you're walking through, you can have joy. Think about Miss Patty Ricardo. We did her celebration of life in here years ago. But I, I spent months going to her house and doing communion with her as she had been given a death sentence and just kept believing for healing and just in the presence of God. You know, I was thinking about this when I was writing this with her. It came to mind. It's like the Lord used her in her darkest days to minister to me. And I didn't even realize it. It got to a point where it wasn't like because I'm Pastor Jason, I had to go see her. I was like, I need to go see her. And the reason why is when I went and sat with her, she just proclaimed the truths of God, would speak the word of God. And she was a joy to be with while she was days away from being absent from the body and present with the Lord. And, like, I'm sharing her story because every, like, she had every reason to be mad, every reason to be upset. She didn't feel good. She didn't, she didn't, she was battling. She was on her deathbed. She was battling. But when I walked in, she, oh, Chase, you know, and just be excited and want to pray. And can we do communion? And, yes, we do communion. Can we play worship? Yes, we play worship. She just with a death sentence, just kept her eyes fixed on Jesus and carried joy laying in a bed. And the Lord used it to minister to me. I'm telling you guys, it's possible. Doesn't have to always be when you got a pocket full of money, everything's going right, there's no drama, my kids slept all night, praise the Lord. It does. You can have joy in the middle of demonic forces attacking you. You can have joy in the middle of circumstances not being the greatest, right? You can have joy in the middle of a bad doctor report. The reason why is because God's there with you in and through all of it. Jesus said he wanted us to have his joy when he prayed for us in John 17, verse 13. It sounds eerily similar to John 15. And in John chapter 3, you'll see the only mention of joy before 15. And you'll see it in 15, 16, and 17, right? But listen to what he says in verse 17 when he's praying for us. And he's saying, he's praying, and so he's talking to the Father. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Do you know what the full measure is to me? It's something that we can walk in even when we don't have a worship team who is leading us in songs, even when we're not just emotionally stirred. And listen, by the way, 
You have emotions. So did Jesus. He felt them. You can feel them. It's okay. I would just encourage you not to make every decision based off of them. But we can have the fullness of joy, meaning no matter what comes our way, right? Hey, what did he say in John 16? Hey, in this world you'll have troubles, but take heart. I've overcome the world, right? So there's the promise of troubles, and then there's the desire to see us walk in the fullness of joy. Let troubles come, we'll still carry the fullness of joy. Why? Because he wants us to have access to him. He knew this was possible, not by our means, but by the infilling of the Holy Spirit that was promised in the upper room. Like, I'm just telling, I, I, the Lord reminded me this weekend, Jason, you don't feel that great. You don't actually look that great. Things are coming that you're not even asking for. And guess what? You got a decision to make. Will you be sad? Will you be mad? Or will you carry joy and meet with me? The other day, I just got tired of carrying things. And I got, I'll be honest, I got tired of talking to Tiffany about it. And so I called for a prayer meeting. And then I disappeared, and I just went in the presence of the Lord and said, you know what? Let all that external stuff just sit. I just need to meet with you. You know what I did? I literally just sat and worshiped and listened. I didn't rattle his ear off about everything that was wrong. It's like, oh, wait, breaking news. I didn't know that, Jason. He knows. I just was like, man, your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. You give rest to the weary. You promise that those who seek you will find you. Here I am. Here I am. I sat down, but you can stand to your feet. I'm going to close with this right here. Here's my prayer for us. It's found in Psalm 68, verse 3. Are you pressed? Do you feel external pressure? Things that are bringing stress, things that are overwhelming. Maybe it's based off decisions you have made. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a spiritual attack. Are you feeling those things? Do you feel like the joy of the Lord is far from you? Something you haven't really accessed recently. You haven't delighted or enjoyed God in His presence because, not because you haven't wanted to, but because there's like an avalanche of life coming your way. Hello. I've got good news for you. He desires for you to experience the fullness of joy. And it is found in his presence. And his presence isn't far off. It's here. He's omnipresent. He's inner present. And he's manifest presence. We felt that in worship this morning. Amen. Like you're like, whoa, I know he's here. I know he's always everywhere. But it's like he gave this room undivided attention for a few moments. Praise God. If this is you, this is my prayer for you. Psalm 68, verse 3. But let the godly rejoice. My prayer is that you'll just release whatever little bit of joy you have in worship throughout the week, not just today, but throughout the week. You'll just be like, man, whatever I got, I'm just going to worship, I'm just going to praise, and I'm just going to release let them be glad in God's presence. Let you be glad in Jesus' name. May you be glad that you can meet with God. One of the things that will help you be glad, if you're like, whoa, he's here. He's in my car. He's in my shower. I'm telling you, the shower is a great place to meet with the Lord. Something about the hot water and not hiding anything. Praise the Lord. May you be glad because you realize God is near and not far off. Amen. And let them be filled with joy. Father, as we go about this week, would you fill your people full of joy? Fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. Renewed passion and zeal for your presence, no matter what the circumstances bring to us, no matter what we face. God, may we press in towards you. 
And may your joy become our strength this week. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, amen. Listen, if you want to learn to be a student of the presence of God and learning to sit, I want to just encourage you to come hang out with us tomorrow night from 6 to 7 in the prayer room. It's going to be incredible. We do that. And then Thursday morning, 6 to 7 a.m. 6 to 7 a.m. Amen. And so if you're like, hey, I don't really do that at home, but I want to learn, why don't you come do it with all of us on Monday night or Thursday morning? Bless you guys. Have an incredible week.